last talk of the conference, and we are gathered here today to talk about containers. My name is Tony, I'm from Indiana, where we have corn, and every two years we can muster a decent professional sports team. So this is the current state of local development. Uh, it may not look as complicated to many of you now, but as your team grows, as your company grows, it'll start to look like this. Uh, if you're on Mac, like many of us are, we probably have Homebrew installed, we have a Ruby version manager installed, we have probably a database installed, and we have at least one app. Now, as your company grows, that app will probably turn into two apps, then three apps, or worse, a microsystem, uh, microservice system throughout. And one of those apps will turn into a legacy app, and you don't bother upgrading Ruby on that, so you're stuck for an, with an older version of Ruby while everything else starts upgrading. Or worse, one app decides we're going to use Postgres 12, but everything else uses Postgres 10. You can only have one version of Postgres really installed, so how do you manage that? Well, containers are all the rage right now with DevOps and deployment, but let's see if it's worth doing it's the same thing for development. So some ground rules for this talk, we're going to use Docker Community Edition for all of these setups. For composition, we're going to use Docker Compose, which, which comes with it. Kubernetes is probably the future of orchestration, however, that is much more complicated uh, than Docker Compose. And for local development's sake, it works out pretty well. Keep in mind, I'm not an expert on this. I've only been doing this for about two years with containers. Um, and with everything in development, there is no correct setup to this. Whenever I say Ruby app, I'm talking about typically a web app, could be Rails, could be Sinatra, could be whatever, but basically something that is running code for web requests. And while it doesn't have to be, uh, if your production app is already containerized by DevOps, you already have a very large head start because you just start stealing everything that they've done for you and just add on stuff that you need. And uh, fair warning, this is not a tutorial on how to use Docker. Uh, but rather how Docker can be set up and situated to uh, work better with local development. And we're going to go through three primary scenarios uh, to show how you can use containerization for local work. All of these scenarios are at least backed by a company uh, already using this setup or something I use personally. First scenario is you have one app or multiple Ruby apps, but the idea with those is they're all completely siloed off. They don't share any resources, they don't talk to each other, completely separate databases, they don't even know about each other. And then you get a little more complicated setup of multiple Ruby applications, and they do talk to each other. This could be a microservice setup, this could be a couple monoliths needing to talk to each other to support um, each other. And they could share a database, God forbid, or they could have separate databases. And then finally, the third scenario is standard, just standard Ruby work. Maybe you're a gem author and we'll see if it's worth setting up uh, containerization just to work on gems. So to start things off, you need an app to run. Uh, for this example, let's just pretend this is a highly complicated multi-million dollar application that your company runs, even though it's just Sinatra with one endpoint. Uh, we're going to need Postgres, we're going to need Redis, and we're going to need um, the image magic binary because we're going to do some image manipulation. Let's just pretend our app does that. And for sake of making everything a little easier, let's just assume all configuration variables are handled in the, with environment variables. The only actual change needed to an existing application for it to be dockerized is to have it bind to IP 000 instead of localhost. Uh, this is just to allow the internal containerization network to bind to it easier. They can't really see localhost, but all zeros are close enough for our cases. For Sinatra, you can manually set it. If you're on Rails, you can set use the dash B flag to bind to an IP address of your choice instead of localhost. So with all containers, we need a Docker file. For our application, we're going to build a Docker file to support it. This is the entire Docker file. We're going to go through line by line real quick on this. Every Docker file has a base image that you're starting from. In this case, we're going to use the Ruby stock image from, Docker, from Docker's hub. And we're going to use the 2.6 tag with the um, stretch uh, Debian distro, which I believe is Debian 
seven. It's the previous one from the current one, I know that. And the benefit of using the tag system here is that you can very closely match what's running production. If you're running Ubuntu, you want to use the Ubuntu um, container. If you're on a different version of Ruby, you want to use that exact uh, version. And the, a great benefit of this is that if you want to update Ruby, you just change that tag, rebuild your containers, and suddenly your local development's running on the new Ruby. You don't need to worry about waiting for RBM to update, uh, compiling Ruby from scratch again. You can just update the tag. Uh, next, we expose whatever port we need to expose from our web app. In this case, it's Sinatra, so port 4567. And optionally, we can set custom environment variables that'll be embedded in the container. In this specific case, I am overriding the default location where gyms are installed. Uh, it'll be in slash bundle inside of the Docker volume. You don't have to do this. I'd like doing this locally just so I can quickly jump to all of the gym code in case I need to do some splunking. Uh, but they're, without this, they're installed in the default location of user Ruby slash bin gyms version num it, that big long thing that no one can remember. And then we're going to install any external dependencies that we need uh, to run our application. In this particular case, we're going to add the Postgres repo uh, to apt-get and install the client libraries because we have the PG gem and those are, need to be installed in order to install the gem and then the image magic binary. This is no different than any command you would normally run in a terminal if you're on a regular Linux distro. Uh, if you've ever used Vagrant before, this is the equivalent of a Vagrant file where you outline step-by-step -step how to build the Vagrant box. Uh, one thing you want to keep in mind is you want to have as few commands as possible, so all of the slashes at the end are there on purpose to say that this is all one command. This is the way that Docker builds containers locally. Every line in the Docker file is a separate snapshot of the state of the container, so if a line changes further down and you rebuild, uh, the first set of lines will say nothing's changed, so it'll just reuse those layers and continue on from there. Then we add a work directory. This is the, a big primary change from what you would have with a production container. A work directory is basically saying where the app code is going to live. Um, majority of tutorials you'll read online will put it in slash app. You can put it wherever you really want. Uh, then we physically copy the gem file and gem file lock into the volume. This is so that the, those two files actually exist so you can then run bundle and install all the gems embedded into the Docker volume. Uh, at the point of saying work directory, the, your app code doesn't necessarily live in the container at that point. So that's why we have to physically move your gem file into the container. And then finally, every container needs some command to run by default. I like just saying run bash just to be up and running because we're going to override this later on in this talk. Alternatively, you can give it an entry point which is a shell script where you can execute multiple commands. So like if you rather have a uh, gem installation happen after the container starts, you can put your bundle command in there and then run whatever command you want to run to start your uh, Ruby application there. So again, here's the completed Docker file. This is the minimum amount of stuff needed to run our Ruby application. Yes, we need Postgres, yes, we need Redis, but we're not actually installing and running it in your container. By rule, every container should do one thing and one thing well. In this case, run our Ruby application. Now we're dealing with multiple containers here because we need a database and a Redis uh, container as well. We do that with the Docker Compose file, which is what Docker Compose uses to know what containers do what and how to start them up. We're going to start with the services section. That's really the only section in the Docker Compose file we care about. Uh, the first entry in the services is the web service, which is our web container. We're going to say it's uh, all the code that it cares about is in the current directory, in this case, the root of your app code. You could technically put this anywhere. However, for local development, commonly uh, developers just throw it in the root of your, the GitHub repo and just let it live there. If you have DevOps, they typically will have a separate repo just for their uh, Docker files or a separate directory embedded in your repo. We then say we want to mount volumes against our uh, web service. 
Uh, again, we're going to use dot at the beginning to say that the current directory, which is all of our code, and then we're going to mount it to slash app and give it the delegated tag. Uh, this is also a change from uh, what production would use. This will tell Docker to, um, to say, any change you make on your local hard drive, pipe it directly into sla slash app in the container. Likewise, if you change any code in the app directory, it'll pipe back down into your hard drive. So this basically it R syncs back and forth in real time. And that's how you can do code changes without having to rebuild the entire container over and over again. We then override the default command. In this case, we're just saying Ruby app RB, which would st start Sinatra for us. And then we declare what ports we want to pull out of the Docker network into our local network. In this case, we're taking Docker's port 4567, which we expose in the Docker file, and pipe that through to port 4567 in our actual local network so we could go to localhost 4567 and be piped into the Docker container. Well, we then add two more services, database and Redis. We're just going to use the, we're going to use the image option and say we want the default Postgres 12 um, container, the default Redis container. The logging driver, none, basically turns logging off. If you need to debug anything, you can just remove those two lines, but they get a little chatty in uh, the logs, so I commonly turn those off by default. We then shove in an environment section into the web services directory. These are custom environment variables exposed just to the container. Um, not unlike the environment, file, uh, environment variables we set in the Docker file, uh, this allows us to just change and add extra variables at will without having, without having to rebuild the container from scratch. In this case, we'll expose the database URL and the Redis URL in our fake application. We'll just assume that's what they use to connect to the database. And then finally, it depends on section, which basically says if I start up the web service, start up the database and Redis services as well. That way, everything starts up with one command. And here's our completed Docker Compose file. This tells Docker, or rather Docker Compose, uh, the different services involved with our application as a whole and what to expose, what to link, and how to start stuff up. So as far as workflow goes, First thing you do when you add these files, you run docker compose build. That will go through the docker compose file and pull down the default uh, Ruby container, the Postgres container, and the Redis container, and also execute all the commands in our docker file and build the web service at this time. You can issue this command over and over again. Nothing will happen because nothing changes in the, in the Docker file. If you actually want to make changes, change the Docker file, and then the point of the first change will be replaced in the uh, web container itself. Starting up, Docker Compose up, it'll start all the services for us. You'll see basically the matrix spin by in your terminal. Um, if you want to start up a singular service, you can give it this ex uh, specific service name. Keep in mind that it'll respect the depend on section. So if we explicit, explicit, explicitly say Docker Compose web, it'll start up the other two containers as well. To turn them off, we can hit Control C or just run Docker Compose down in another terminal window, and they go away pretty much. But that's great, except you know we need to actually do stuff with our code other than just run it. Uh, we need to run rake tasks. We need to drop into a console and debug stuff. With that, the flow is using Docker Compose exec, which you give it a service name and a command to run. So if you want to list all the rake tasks, you can say Docker Compose exec web rake dash t, it'll connect to the automat already running container, execute that command, spit out standard out to you, and exit out. Same thing with IRB or Rails console, or if you just want to run bash, which is like SSHing into the container is the best way I could describe it. And you can just dig around and do whatever you want in there pretty much. That is pretty much the flow, and the only real flow changes to using containers locally. Uh, using Bringing all that back around, we CD into my app, run build. I didn't show the output for that. It's just a bunch of garbly goop for a lot of people. Run Docker Compose up, we see that the DB container started, the Redis container started, and the web container started. Sinatra takes the stage at the right port. We go to localhost 4567, and there's our endpoint. Congratulations, we have containerized a local app uh, from scratch. Well, that was fun. Let's actually talk about, is it worth doing all of that? So we talked about having three scenarios. This is the 
easiest one. One or more uh, Ruby applications, they don't talk to each other. They are completely independent of each other. And the setup for this I find best is basically do what we just did for each repo. You make a Docker file, you make a Docker Compose file, you outline what external services you need, and you just CD into the app and just run that application. Uh, this is fine, uh, this is great for side projects or smaller teams, especially if you only have one app. Uh, if you have, end up having multiple apps, uh, this is also great because it makes a clear separation of context switching. If I want to work on app two, I stop, if, am I, and I'm already in app one, I stop app one, CD into app two, start that up, and do my work. That way they're not talking to each other, they're not conflicting with each other, and more importantly, because this is technically virtualization, they're not competing for laptop resources. Docker is a little uh, RAM hungry, I'll just put it that way. An alternative to this setup, multiple separate Ruby applications, but we only use Docker for external dependencies, like the database. This is a hybrid approach to the classic way of running uh, apps locally and containerizing it. Your Ruby code still runs on your laptop. So you install Ruby like normal, you run bundle install, you install all of your, excuse me, uh, gem dependencies, and you just use Docker for the database. This allows for the benefit of, you don't have to worry about managing Postgres upgrades. By the way, the way you upgrade Postgres is you dump the existing database, blow away the old Postgres installation, install the new one, and restore from a backup. In this case with Docker, you can change the tag in the compose file, blow away all of those containers, bring up a new container, and restore your dev database at that point, which everyone should be using seed files and not a bad copy of production from multiple years ago. <clears throat> Just don't do that. <clears throat> and like before, it allows for a separation, uh, a good separation of context switching, switch to app one, do your work there, switch to app two, work there. Um, because the Ruby code is not in Docker, you do get a small performance boost out of that, similar to like the old way of running stuff locally. But you get the benefit of, you can even experiment with different versions of uh, databases or different data stores against your code by just pulling down containers, spinning them up. You don't need to worry about uh, installing locally, configuring them locally, where the hell are the log files stored. It's just kind of nice like that. Workflow is similar to before. Docker Compose up. You can sp specify just the database and Redis containers and then manually execute whatever you need to start your local server. But that's the, that's pretty much the easy scenario. And with that, is that worth it? I say code in Docker with all the other dependencies is worth it. Like I said, it's great for context switching, especially if you have a bunch of projects on your local laptop. Uh, this is my personal one. I, have, I maintain four other Ruby applications on the side. It's great so I can just switch back and forth as needed. I don't need to worry about one of them has MySQL, one of them uses Postgres. Uh, they're just all there contained in the Docker environment. With code, Outside of containers, it's also worth it. Um, a company called Lessonly in Indiana explicitly uses this setup. It allows them to speed up onboarding a bit because the steps for that is just install Ruby, install the gems, which hopefully most Rubyists know how to do by then, and then install Docker, run this command, and here's your database done. You don't need to include the step of install Homebrew, install the right version of Postgres, uh, start that up, here is construct your uh, environment URLs this way and kind of hope for the best because Homebrew only keeps the last three versions of all major releases and the app's out of date. Oh God, they removed the old one. How do we set them up now? Oh no. <laughs> Throw them in a container because they're all there. So that, like I said, that's the easy scenario. How about this scenario? Let's say you have a client-facing application may, and uses Sidekick for background jobs. Has a main database, has its own Redis instance, and your company introduces a second application that uses Elasticsearch, its own Redis instance, and it also uses the main database. Oh yeah, and app one and app two talk to each other through an HTTP protocol. Oh yeah, and now app three is introduced that uses its own database. And app three also talks to the main database. App 4 comes along suddenly and it talks to the secondary database. 
And app five comes out of nowhere. You're not sure where that came from. It just kind of showed up one day. Uh, it uses its own database and it talks to the main database. This may or may not be a, an actual setup, but. Uh, <laughs> and your company has grown hopefully by then. This is not a single person project. Uh, and you're split off into teams because you're about 20 to 30 at this point. The primary, we'll call them primary teams, only care about app one and app two because they are the client facing ones. They're the ones that dig into that code more, most often. We'll have another set of teams we'll call specialty teams to support the business. They care about only app four and app three. And by you know extension, app uh, DB1 in a sense, because app three needs to talk to it. And you just have one guy that like does app five. Uh, no one really knows what the code looks like because not everyone has access to that repo, but sure, it's there too. So let's see how we can organize uh, containers with this. Oh, and oh yeah, um, two of them aren't even in Ruby. They are two different languages. Great. So how does this look like? Well, here's one way to set it up. Uh, mandate your entire team basically uh, checks out all the code in the same directory. So we'll call it, just for sake of argument, we'll say home slash work slash app one, app two, app three, app four, app five, and that's where the code lives locally. And we'll introduce a sixth repo. We'll call it bootstrap. Bootstrap only has Docker files and the Docker compose file. It is responsible for orchestrating that entire mess from the previous slide. As far as how to build where the file, files live and what various piece, pieces and parts of the entire system need each other to work. Here's a very compressed version of what the Docker Compose file would look like. We're going to cheat here and say, they're all fine with Postgres 12, so we'll just have one database service. A database cluster can support multiple databases, so we have three databases in this case, We'll just use one cluster to use that. They're still separated out functionally, at least on disk. Same thing with Redis. Redis supports up to 16, well, more than one, I know, databases internally through uh, Redis URL trickery. And so all the apps that need Redis can connect to the same URL with an extra flag to say, I want database zero, one, two, or three based on their needs. And then we have an entry for every app. Uh, Unlike before, the only real change is the build section in which we say instead of the code living in the same directory as uh, the Docker compose file, we say that the context is up one directory in app one, and we manually specify where the Docker file lives for app one. Uh, yes, we have to jump out of one directory and jump into the existing directory. That seems to be a weird thing that Docker does and they won't fix it even though people ask for it, but just go with that. We specify separate environment variables for every application, so app one can have database URL, app two could also have its own database URL, but it can talk to another database completely. So this allows for um, maintaining consistency on all of the environment variables throughout all of your apps. And we set the depends on, uh, like before, app one needs Redis, DB, and app two to run. Uh, repeat ad nauseum through app one, two, three, four, and five. And the workflow for that is uh, for developers, instead of going into the app they want to work on, they CD into Bootstrap and say Docker Compose up on the apps that they actually care about. So the primary teams can say Docker Compose up app one and app two. Uh, it starts app one, app two, Elasticsearch, which wasn't mentioned in the previous slide, Redis, DB, they all run, they do their code, everything's hunky-dory, they don't need to worry about app three through five. Same thing for the other teams, they start the actual apps that they care about, and you move on. Or here's another alternative, multiple Docker Compose files. By default, Docker Compose will look at the Docker Compose YAML file. However, you can tell it to look at other files as well. So we have the primary teams. They are the overwhelming majority of the engineering department, let's just say. So they really only focus on app one and app two. They don't care about the others. So what you can do is set up the proper services in the primary Docker Compose file, only to find app one and app two. We make another Docker Compose file, we'll just call it ST for specialty teams or whatever. 
and you only have entries for app three and app four. Uh, there is a little duplication here. Um, it's not visible here, obviously, but DB and Redis are just copy and paste it from each other. They're just going to use the same cluster and same volume. <clears throat> Excuse me. It just kind of works a little nicer that way. You can separate them out if you really want to. Uh, but I find it's easier just, it's all one database. Well, it's separate databases, but just one cluster that you have to worry about. And so the flow for that is CD into Bootstrap, Docker Compose up, you just start app one and app two. That way the majority of the engineering team doesn't even need to know that there's another Docker Compose file you need to worry about or any other apps. For the other teams, you could use the F flag to say I want this specific Docker Compose file loaded up and then you can use that, the second line, and say that and run app, two, app three and app four. Or if you really want to and start the entire system up from scratch, Docker Compose up, pass in two dash F flags to load up both Docker Compose files. Last, uh, it basically merges the YAML glob together, last one in wins for any duplicate keys, and that'll start the entire thing and your fans will kick on and you can then cook an egg if you really want to. So with all that, why? Well, it allows the teams to focus just on the apps that they care about. Uh, with the secondary approach, they don't even need to check out apps, the main team, do, team doesn't need to even check out app three through app five. In the first example, you needed all the code checked out, uh, regardless if you used it or not, because when you run Docker Compose, it reads the entire Compose file, and if something's amiss, like this directory doesn't exist, it'll just scream bloody murder and stop at that point. So the secondary approach of multiple Compose files works pretty well, that way you have a new member of the primary team comes in, check out Bootstrap, check out App 1, check out App 2, install Docker, start things up, you're ready to go. Everything's ready to go at that point. It'll, and I, as I just mentioned, it does allow for much more streamlined bootstrapping at that point. No need to install Ruby, no need to configure Postgres, no need to figure out Elasticsearch. By the way, you need to install Java for that, great. That's another step you have to remember. No need for complicated uh, bin slash setups that will go out of date within two weeks. And then so all new developers come in, they're gonna have to debug it anyway because stuff has changed. The only sort of downside is, is there's a lot, obviously there's a lot more moving parts. C some communication is needed between teams at this point. So if a major Postgres upgrade happens, we can just go into Bootstrap, open a pull request, update the tag to whatever the latest Postgres is, that gets merged, and then you have to just tell everyone, hey, pull down the latest bootstrap, uh, rebuild all your containers, and you're good to go. Because someone's probably going to write some code knowing that the Postgres upgrade happened, that only works on the latest version of Postgres, and then suddenly everyone, it, suddenly you have stuff, um, messages in Slack saying, why is the code suddenly broken? Well, you didn't read the email I sent out to everyone last week, but. So with all that, Multiple apps, multiple teams, cats and dogs living together. Is it worth it? Hell yes, this is worth it. Uh, this is used by uh, Springbuck, also in Indiana. Uh, that setup is not too far off of how they work. Um, five applications, three databases, Elasticsearch, Sidekick, a partridge in a pear tree. Um, having to set that up manually for developers, even the, like even the higher level developers that probably need to see all applications would be almost a nightmare at that point because you need to then remember, oh, you need to start up all the applications that you need to actually work with. You need to make sure Postgres is actually running. You need to actually have all that, all the three databases in memory at that point uh, and it will just become a mess. So what they did, they adopted, adopted Docker. They started with a couple applications, uh, got those working and as the company grew and more apps were built, they just kept appending on to that bootstrap uh, repo and to the point where they added app five and no other team really noticed because it was a separate Docker file, separate um, Docker Compose file just in the bootstrap directory and then that one person who's just off in the corner doing his own thing can just work with it. The main teams didn't even know it existed for a couple months. So let's move on to the last scenario uh, gym development. Uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, um, this is not a great solution. I tried this. I maintain a couple gyms. 
Um, so the scenario is you have multiple gyms you could work on. They're each in their own directories, and maybe you just want a scratch pad just to run Ruby code for whatever reason. You may or may not have dependencies. Who knows? Um, but a way I came up to work with this is you have a Docker and a Docker Compose file in a root directory somewhere, and then any and all gem code is then checked out into another directory uh, above that, and the idea is you have one Docker file that basically just runs Ruby, and all the directories are just kind of mounted to the root of the volume at that point. So here's a very oversimplified Docker file. I didn't want to post the entire thing I did to try to get this to even work. Um, instead of saying we want the Ruby uh, default container, we are just using Buster, which is the latest Debian. And unseen un here, all of the commands to manually bootstrap RBM, install all the Rubies independently that we want to install, because if we're a gem developer, you probably want to have multiple Rubies installed, at least tested locally. Uh, just set work directory to the root of all the other code bases, run bash, um, and that's pretty much it. Docker compose file is a little more straightforward, uh, similar to the first example, except you can then tack, what is nice about this is you can tack on to the services all the external stuff you want. So if you build a gym that is working with active record and you wanna actually run the code against every database that Rails supports, you can add MySQL, Redis, Postgres, um, uh, SQLite, uh, if you can find one, I guess a container for Oracle, maybe. Don't, don't do that, but you could try to do that. And that way you have all these services running or you can mainly start and stop these services as needed in the Docker environment and you can just run your tests that way. Yeah, so it is nice that you have all your external dependencies in the Docker network. Uh, that way you don't have to manually install and manage all these different database types or what have you. Um, you can get away without installing Ruby that way as well. Um, and you can just add more services if more external stuff happens. And that's all I could come up with. I tried it for a week and I hated my life. So in my opinion, it is not worth it for standard Ruby hacking or gem development. An alternative to this would be if you have a gem that needs a lot of external dependencies, use example one as your template and just throw your Docker file into compose file in the root of your code base there. Um, that way at least if contributors can at least pull that down if they want to work on it and have all the stuff that they need to set up. I think this is similar-ish to how you can work on Rails locally. I think they use Vagrant for that, but it's a similar setup as here's all the configuration ready to go, starts up everything you need, and you can just start coding that way. So like I said, uh, if you have a lot of dependencies, that kind of works, but not for just one-off stuff. So amongst all of these examples, there are pros that there are shared between them. It does simplify bootstrapping overall. You don't need to install everything manually at that point. Check out apps, install Docker, start build, run, you're ready to go at that point. Um, and I cannot stress this enough, the closer you are to production from your dev environment, the better. Just because, I mean, if, if anyone's ever tried to shell out to a Mac OS binary and wonder why grep suddenly can't use regexes, well, that's because BSD binaries don't have that. It's on Linux, so you have to figure out how to install the GNU binaries, and no one wants to do that because it's a mess. So yeah, closer to, develop, to production at that point. Dependencies are all maintained. You could install Postgres 10, 12, 9, 5, whatever you want separately, have those running independently of each other. Upgrades are easy, change the tag, rebuild, done. That's a great way to even determine will the app even run on the latest version of Ruby if a major upgrade happens. The build doesn't work, well, obviously you need to figure some stuff out at that point. And if anything's broken, just rebuild everything. Just throw everything away. Your code should bring you joy. Everything inside the actual container, such as the database, should not bring you joy, should be thrown away at any point. All you care about is the code. However, there are cons against everything uh, as well. Um, everything's in a VM, it's going to be slower. There's really no good way around that. It's running a VM. So if, you want, if you're doing some heavy number crunching, you're going to be waiting a bit longer locally than you would if you run it on the metal. Although I hope even on the metal, it's still not as fast as production at that point. 
Ironically, if you use linters, you still need to install languages. Uh, if you use Rubicop, for example, and your um, local editor uh, executes Rubicop on save for linting, you could have it shell into a running Docker container and execute Rubicop that way. Code Climate does something similar to that. Uh, however, if you want a fast feedback loop, you'll probably be waiting at least an extra second or two for everything to connect and start up. So ironically, yeah, you could probably, you probably still need to install Ruby locally, install Rubicop and just go with that. Same thing for Node and ESLint if you're a JavaScript developer. If you're on Mac, file system isn't great. Uh, I have seen times where the Mac file system does not tell Docker, hey, this file changed, go ahead and sync that up. For the life of me, I stare at it for, stare at code for about 20 minutes, why this change hasn't looked like happened in the actual app. So I uh, start, I turn Docker off, back on again, suddenly the changes are there. That's more on Mac side than anything else. Uh, it does add a layer of complexity. I mean, it's another completely separate system compared to the rest of the app. So there is, there is a flow learning curve as far as, all right, remember the code is running in the container. You're not running it locally. You're writing the code locally and it goes into the container. Uh, some junior devs, that's harder to get their heads wrapped around if they never work with it, but it's more of a training thing. Um, and Docker likes RAM and CPU and hard drive space. So if you suddenly run out of hard drive space and you build containers a lot, Penelope has a couple commands for you to blow everything away and rebuild. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, the Docker file, every line in that uh, file, if it changes or is ran, it builds basically a shallow copy of the state of the container at that point, so that way if anything changes, it can jump to that last point of no changes and continue on there. Docker doesn't tend to clean that up after a cache is busted sometimes. I'm sure it'll be fixed. If not already, please make sure you're on the latest version. Uh, but if not, you can just blow away everything and start again because, again, the code should bring you happiness, not anything in the containers. So with all that, local containers for development, are, it, it is technically your call. It's a flow change. It's virtualization. It is technically slower. Um, I think it's worth it most of the time, especially if you have multiple apps. If you have a single app for your company, maybe at, as a starting point, it may not be worth it. But if you feel like you're going to at least grow and have multiple services running, uh, multiple apps running, you probably want to at least think about doing that or at least some other orchestration system to make bootstrapping and just working a little bit easier. Uh, it's totally up to you if you want to change your flow because this is a flow change uh, at its core. But uh, that's pretty much all I got on the subject. Um, copy of the slides can be shown there. One, two, one more final shout out to those two great indie shops. Pretty sure they're hiring at this point. Uh, you can find me on Twitter where I just retweet people. I don't really say much, but you can see my re retweets. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, any quick questions? We got about a minute, or I can answer out in the hallway. All right. Thank you.